All right. Well, welcome everybody to Psycho's Platters, episode 172. That's right. This one today, um, we are going to do a specific episode in hand. The t-shirt is the hint. That's right. I got my, <laughs> I found my Beatles Sgt. Pepper shirt, which I actually like this shirt. I do. I'd like to find one with the whole album cover, but uh, picked this one up for two bucks at a Goodwill about a couple years back. It still fits me. I'm amazed about that bit. So, what are we going to be talking about? Obviously... Sergeant Pepper, yes. Now I know some of you guys out there, uh, you be Beatle fans, or just or just really great album fans, uh, are going off and going, hmm. This is the 50th anniversary coming up. This is the 50th anniversary coming up. Uh, this is my mono copy. This is my stereo copy. Um, a little bit bent on that bottom one there, but but let me let me let me show you here. Um, Let's see here. This one's the slightly better of the two. Now, uh, you know what? No. We're going to go this way with this, okay? Uh, like I said, this is my monocopy. Your gatefold, of course. Um, let's see here. Do I have... Well, I'll tell you this. One of my copies does actually have the, uh, the inner sleeve from it. But um, So I want to talk about the 50th anniversary release but of course I want to go off and mention to you the history like I always do and and an interesting little website blog, a blog here I also want to bring up which is going to tie into what we're talking about so I'll try not to make this for forever ridiculous long but we'll see uh, so eighth studio album from the Beatles released June 1st 1967 it spent 27 weeks 27 weeks at the top of the LP chart in the UK 15 weeks at number one in the U.S. Won four Grammys, including Album of the Year in 1968 for that Grammy. First rock LP to receive that honor. Um, short history of this. During return flight to London in November of 66, Paul McCartney had an idea for a song involving an Edwardian era military band. Uh, that song ended up growing into a concept from there. Recording for the album started November 24, 1966 at Abbey Road Studio 2 with Strawberry Fields, Forever, and Penny Lane. Uh, EMI, though, put pressure on the group to release some new product, and so therefore they gave that to be the double A single that would come out um, and didn't end up on the album. In, uh, in February 1967, the Sgt. Pepper's song was recorded, and uh, Paul kind of suggested to the rest of the band, hey, guess what? Why don't we go into an alter ego mode for experimentally experimenting musically? And uh, George Martin and Jeff Emmerich did their studio wizardry for this album. And uh, as of 2011, 32 million copies sold worldwide. Rolling Stone magazine number one in the 500 greatest albums of all time. Saying that, I want to jump to, like I said, uh, I'm going to be looking at my computer screen, so you're going to have to bear with me a little bit, but I couldn't pass this up. Uh, this was from youdiscovermusic.com, and you can look at this too if you want, but the article says, for the benefit of Beatles fans, uh, there's basically 50, 50 interesting facts tied to the album, okay? So we're just going to go down the line, and then after that, I'm going to tell you what is going to be ending up on this deluxe edition that's coming out May 26th. So, um, like I said, some of this is going to be a little repetitive from the history I just told you, but bear with me. After the release of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper Lonely Hearts Club Band on June 1st, 1967, it spent the remainder of the year on the UK charts and returned to the top to the top on November, excuse me, February 3rd, 1968, replacing the soundtrack to The Sound of Music. Uh, it spent 15 weeks at number one in America. In 2003, Rolling Stone, like I said, made it number one on the 500 greatest albums of all time. Sgt. Pepper was recorded using four-track equipment, which, you know, it's totally amazing to me, even, you know, for that time and that technology, how damn good this album sounds. Critic Kenneth Tynan describes it as a decisive moment in the history of Western civilization. 
Time Magazine called it a historic departure in the progress of music. Paul plays a grand piano on the day of life, day in the life. The BBC banned that tune, though, because of the phrase, I'd love to turn you on. Never said I could sing. Uh, <laughs> what the BBC claiming, it could encourage a permissive attitude towards drug taking. <laughs> Uh, recording was completed on 21st of April of 67 and was released on June 1st. Let that sink into your head for a minute. It got finished April 21st of 67. See, you're talking, what, mixing, mastering, um, making the product, and then releasing it on June 1st. That's not, that's what, five weeks? <laughs> that's pretty damn good. It's, it's amazing if you think about it. Maybe that was the typical cycle of an album at the time. To me, that just blows my mind. Um, George Martin had recorded the crowd noises at the start of, with a little help from my friends during a Beatles concert at the Hollywood Bowl. So that's Hollywood Bowl audience members. The Oxford Encyclopedia of British Literature called it the most important and influential rock and roll album ever recorded. Pop artist Peter Blake and John, Hay and John Hayworth designed the album cover from an ink drawing from Paul McCartney. Engineer Jeff Emmerich said, We spent three weeks on the mono mixes and maybe three days on the stereo. Now, to me, and I'm just saying, you know, put your opinions down, you know, and I mean opinions. All this is an opinionated piece of what I'm going to tell you. But stick it down in the comments here. Which one's your favorite, mono or stereo? To me, out of all honesty, I think John Lennon was correct when he went off and said that the best way to listen to this fine album is the mono version with headphones. And I remember when I ended up getting this album, um, 1980-81 was when I picked up my first original of this and played it with headphones. Sitting in the beanbag chair, I remember this in my bedroom. <laughs> I heard things I never heard. And what I mean by that is, is I had the cassette version of that thing, okay, played it on my Walkman. Yeah, I know, I'm dating myself. I had the stereo. I actually ended up picking up, th this, is the sta this is the same stereo copy I have from 19... No, I think 1980. I think I picked this up a couple months before I picked up my mono copy. So I ended up, this is the same one from over 35 years ago I picked up at a garage sale for 50 cents. Okay. I have the stereo first. For some reason, like I said, it, it was a different mix, you could tell. And with the mono, you heard things. You heard studio chatter. You heard extra, extra noises and a little bit different instrumentation on those mono mixes. I'm, you know, from what I heard, I think George Martin said he liked the stereo better. And while George Martin's George Martin, I'm sorry, what do you think? Mono or stereo mix? Tell me in the comments below. Uh, Alright, so, uh, Paul plays a Lowry organ on Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. The Beatles sold replicas of the coats they wore on the album sleeve in their short-lived Apple Boutique. That would have been awesome. Anybody out there happen to have one? I definitely would have gotten that one of those. Uh, that I think the Apple Boutique only lasted a couple months. Ringo's drumming on A Day in the Life has been described as one of his most inventive drum parts on record. John Lyrics for Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite is from an 1843 poster for Pablo Fonks. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Circus, that he bought in an antique shop in Kent while filming the promo film for Strawberry Fields Forever. George Martin plays a harpsichord on Fixing a Hole. Richard Goldstein describes She's Leaving Home in the New York Times 1967 review as uninspiring. George Martin plays a harmonium on Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite. John took inspiration for lyrics for A Day in the Life from a newspaper I was writing the song with the Daily Mail propped up in front of me at the piano. There was a paragraph about 4,000 potholes in Blackburn, Lancashire. George plays a tambura on Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. The album cover art costs nearly 3,000 pounds, 60 times more than was normally spent at that time. 700 hours 
were, re were spent recording the album. In 2006, music scholar David Scott Kasten described it as the most important and influential rock and roll album ever recorded. The Beatles played an acetate of the album to singer Cass Elliot from the Mamas and Papas at her flat off Kings Road in Chelsea at 6 in the morning, full volume with speakers set up by the open windows. In 1967, it was the third biggest selling album of the year in America. I wonder what the first two were. I'd like to know about that. Three days after its release, the Jimi Hendrix Experience opened a show at the Saville Theatre in London with a rendition of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And uh, George and Paul attended the performance. The collage on the front cover includes 57 photographs and nine waxworks that depict a diversity of famous people. Well, that's kind of obvious, right? The New York Times Book Review described it as a harbinger of a golden renaissance of song. In 2008, the bass drum skin used on the front cover sold at auction for over 670,000 euro. A TV commercial for Kellogg's Corn Flakes inspired John's Good Morning, Good Morning. Paul originally wrote the tune for When I'm 64 in the late 1950s as an instrumental, and a version of it occasionally performed by the Beatles during their Hamburg shows. When Paul was asked why Elvis Presley wasn't on the album cover, he said, Elvis was too important and too far above the rest even to mention. So he didn't put him on the list because he was more than merely a pop singer. He was Elvis the King. I know, that was a crummy imitation, wasn't it? The BBC band, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, because of the phrase, Henry the Horse. Because of a phrase that contains two common slang terms for heroin. Boy, oh boy, the BBC just... They are prudes. <laughs> While the BBC thought Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds was a reference to LSD, of course, John insisted, hey, it was a pastel drawing from his four-year-old son, Julian. You've seen the picture of that drawing, haven't you? I know I have. At the 1968 Grammy Awards, Sgt. Pepper, of course, won Best Album Cover, Graphic Art, Best Engineered Recording, Non-Classical, and Best Contemporary Album. It also won Album of the Year, the first one to receive that honor, like I said earlier. Paul sings five lead vocals, John three, they share the lead on two. On one song, John, Paul, and George share the lead, and Ringo sings, of course, lead on one song. In 1967, it was the best-selling album of the year in UK. The album's inner sleeve was featured artwork by the Dutch design team, The Fool. According to Paul, one of the things we were very much into in those days was iMessages. So with Michael Cooper's inside photo, we all said, we all said, now look into this camera and really say I love you. Really try and feel love. Really give love through this. It'll come out. It'll show. It's an attitude. And that's what that is. If you look at it, you'll see the big effort from the eyes. The lyrics were printed in full on the back cover the first time that this was done on a rock album. At the end of George's song, Within You, Without You, there's laughter. According to George, well, after all that long Indian stuff, you want some light relief. It's a release after five minutes of sad music. In 1994, Sgt. Pepper was ranked first in Colin Larkin's all-time top thousand albums. Ringo says, the biggest memory I have of Sgt. Pepper is I learned to play chess. The album was recorded at Abbey Road Studio, except for fixing a hole that was recorded at Regent Sound Studio in London on February 9, 1967. The string section and harp on She's Leaving Home was arranged by Mike Leander. The saxophone on Good Morning, Good Morning is British Beat Boom Band Sounds Incorporated. Newsweek's Jack Kroll called it a masterpiece, comparing the lyrics to the writing of Edith, Edith Sitwell, Harold Painter, Pinter, and T.S. Eliot, a day in the life he compared to Eliot's The Wasteland. All right, one last one. <laughs> um, Langdon Winter said in Rolling Stone, the closest Western civilization has come to unity since the Congress of Vienna in 1815 was the week Sgt. Pepper was released. In every city in Europe and America, the radio stations played it and everyone listened. So that was the 50 things on that one, too. Now, I want to go here really quick. Like I said, I, I know, you know, um, normally I don't go word for word on stuff like this, but I think this is kind of fun. So here's what's happening, of course. May 26th, this is these different versions of the 50th anniversary album of Sgt. Pepper are going to be coming out. So bear with me. 
this is what you're looking at. And you know what? And if you, you know, you want to get more into detail on this, there's several different websites that you'll be able to pull this up. But like I said, once again, you discover music happens to have this as well at the end of this. The standard CD is going to be a new 2017 stereo mix, complete with the original UK albums edit for the for the end runoff groove. Uh, deluxe 2 CD and digital edition. The new stereo album mix on disc one, plus a second CD of 18 tracks, including pre previously unreleased complete takes of the album's 13 songs, newly mixed in stereo and sequenced in the same order as the album. Disc two also includes a new stereo mix and a previously unreleased instrumental take of Plant Penny Lane, plus the 2015 stereo mix and two previously unreleased complete takes of Strawberry Fields. The Deluxe 2 LP, new stereo album mix on disc one, previously unreleased complete takes of the 13 songs on the album, newly mixed in stereo sequence in the same order as the album on disc two. Super Deluxe 4 CD and DVD and Blu-ray. Disc one, 2017 stereo album mix, disc two, and three includes 33 additional recordings from the studio sessions, most of which have been previously unreleased and been mixed for the first time from the four-track session tapes, sequenced in chronological order of the recording dates plus the new 2017 stereo mix of Penny Lane and 2015 stereo mix of Strawberry Fields Forever. CD4 contains a direct transfer of the album's original mono mix plus the Strawberry Field Forever and Penny Lane singles, along with the U.S. promo mono mix of Penny Lane that's the one with the piccolo uh, trumpet at the end uh, as well. And previously unreleased early mono mixes of She's Leaving Home. A Day, a Day in the Life and the once thought lost early mono mix of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. The DVD and Blu-ray discs include new 5.1 surround audio mixes of the album and Penny Lane by Giles Martin and Sam McHale plus their 2015 5.1 surround sound mix of Strawberry Fields Forever, along with high-resolution audio mixes of the album Penny Lane and the 2015 stereo mix of Strawberry Fields Forever. Additionally, these discs will include 4K restored promo clips for Strawberry Fields, Penny Lane, and A Day in the Life, plus the making of Sgt. Pepper, which is a restored, previously unreleased documentary film originally broadcast in 1992. <sighs> That's a lot to that's a lot to say and remember here, kids. Um, you already know what Sgt. Pepper album is going to be. But like I said, it's a stereo mix. Your your outtakes. You have got four all. You've got four alternate takes of Strawberry with the stereo mix. When I'm 64, there's a take. Penny Lane, there's a take. Vocal overdubs. 2017 stereo mix. Day in the Life. There's two takes of that. Orchestra overdub. Hum last chord. Um, Sergeant Pepper, Lonely Hearts, two, two takes of that, two takes of Good Morning, Good Morning. Uh, CD3 outtakes, Fixing a Hole, there's two takes, Being for the Benefit, there is, there's two takes I'm seeing, Lovely Rita, there's a take, Lucy in the Sky, there's two takes, Getting Better, two takes, Within You, Without You, two takes, She's Leaving Home, two takes, With a Little Help. Uh, one take, false start, and then take two instrumental, and then the reprise of Sgt. Pepper is another take. Um, take the CD4, Sgt. Pepper bonus tracks in mono. Um, I already mentioned pretty much about that. Lucy in the Sky will be an unreleased mono mix, number 11. Day in the Life, first mono mix. She's Leaving Home, first mono mix. Penny Lane, the promo single, mono mix. So all of that you're going to end up getting on that. So, what I'm going to ask is this. Once again, this is an opinionated video. Please put your comments down here. I know it's a lot of information to tell you about all this, but I think it's important to Beatle fans and music fans like us alike here in the YouTube Vinyl community. Do me a favor in the comments, please. Tell me, tell me, are you going to buy it? Are you going to buy any of the versions? Which version are you going to buy? Do you think that Capitol Records left something out? You think Apple Corps left something out? And I know some people are going to go off and go, Carnival of Light. Um, I don't know. There's a controversy about that. Although, yes, it was recorded, I'm led to believe, during that time period. Why is Carnival of Light not on there? Um, are you guys upset that 
Strawberry Fields of Penny Lane are being grafted onto this album, even though technically it was at the start of the Sgt. Pepper recording sessions. Tell me what you feel down in the comments. Uh, I'm going to shut up because I know this is going to be a very long video, but I appreciate you guys watching this. You know, like and subscribe to, uh, to the Psycho Splatters channel here because there will be a lot more interesting review type stuff uh, to come. But please, like I said, put your comments on and uh, take care. God bless. Rock on. I'll save for the next episode for all the shout-outs. Take care.